Low-income earners, earners in America are being priced out of new cars market while high earners are buying more than ever before. Spending on new cars by the lowest 20% of earners reach its lowest in 11 years while spending by the top 20% reached its highest on the record according to 2021 Consumer Expenditure Survey. So by the way, what they're saying is the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poor, which I'll have my point on this one here in a minute. The average price of a new car in the U.S. hit $48,008 in March, up 30% from March of 2020. And the demand for cheaper models have been shrinking for years. The problem preventing many Americans from buying new cars are twofold. One, rising interest rates have made car loans far more expensive with the average monthly payment reaching 7.30 in April of 2020. Second, the supply of cheaper cars have been shrinking as manufacturers focus on more expensive high-end models. The global chip shortage caused by the pandemic has forced automakers to ration their components, reserving them from more profitable vehicles. Tom, what are your thoughts on this? I got some thoughts, but I want to hear from you first. Um, well, this is this is what's, you know, when um, when money is no longer free, and you can no longer get, you know, that two-year lease with those teaser rates. Yep. Um, you know, and, and a lot, let's face it, a lot of people are aspirational about their cars. And what I mean by that is they run to the payment that they think they can afford to get the glitzier vehicle. Very few people are thinking like, you know, Dave Ramsey and other people that says, hey, be very practical about your personal budget and the car you get. Think about safety. Think about what you can get. But right now what I see, I see this. Um, a friend of mine. Turns in a Mercedes GL SUV. Now, remember, this is, we're not talking a G Wagon, just Mercedes GL. And it, he had it on a three year lease in the name of his company. He goes into the dealer and he says, What's my buyout on this? Because the vehicles are expensive. I'm just going to buy the vehicle. Um, and he says, Give me the number. And he said, Well, we'll give you two numbers. Here's the buyout number that's in your contract, and here's $15,000. Mm-hmm. He said, What's the $15,000? We will buy that vehicle from you right now for $15,000. And he said, Yeah, but if I walk back in the door to get another new one on lease, what's that going to be? And so the economics didn't add up. And so he paid about $48,000, bought out the Mercedes GL, had very low miles on it. Um, after three years. And then it's like, oh my gosh, the high-end cars, the demand is there to the point that that was a local Mercedes dealership wanted to do that. The average Um, person can't do that, though. No, the average person can't do that, but that's the point they're making about what's happening in the high end. Now, on the the low end, what's what's happening is the American public has been a payment-based public, right? The average person is payment based. Oh, I can afford that payment, so I can get something a little financing bit. Financing everything. Credit financing card, everything. everything. Yeah. And they do they do the payment uh, to lifestyle. I can afford that payment, so I want to step up so I can get the lifestyle out of it. And what's happening is the interest rates are up and the little mini lease and the cheap lease, two year, three year yeah, lease, yeah. the party's over. And now they're having to go in and look at wow, that's forty eight thousand dollars plus ten percent and everything. So mm-hmm. it's fifty three out the door. And I'll put you know, five grand down if they've got that. So forty five thousand over five years, bingo, seven hundred bucks. You know, and it's um and, and there's the pinch point. And I think the pinch point is the reality. And the average American doesn't want to go in and get the base model, you know, Toyota Corolla. That's not what they want. You don't have a choice though. But but here's what I will tell you. Here's what I will tell you. To the people who talk about the rich get rich and the poor get poor and they complain about it. You have to realize, every one of these things that you're seeing happen that's destroying middle America. Folks, the, the, the concept of, well, you see, you know, what, what, what about the middle American income? You know, what, what, they can't afford a car like this. Well, let's talk about why, what's causing this. What is causing this to destroy middle America that they can't afford something like this? Because the guys in the middle that are working their tails off for 22 bucks an hour, 28 bucks an hour, trying to do what they can for their kids, their families... You know, they're sitting there saying, I cannot get a new car. I I can't get a new car. I have to go finance the used one, and it's backfiring on me. Bad policies have consequences. Many policies seem noble. Today I'm reading a book. It's called Toxic uh, Charity. I don't know if you've read this book, Toxic Charity. And I'm going through it. And he starts off the book, Tom, by saying the following. He says, I I have to read this to you. He says, uh, uh, oh, man, I got to find this to tell you. There it is. Okay. He says, over a trillion dollars of charity 
was given to Africa. Do you know what percentage of the money that was given to Africa was actually used and went to the people? 15%. 85% of the trillion dollars that was given to Africa to help. Everybody was like, we're going to help Africa. We are the world. We are the children. Every was like, this, what a great cause. Let's keep raising money. Dude, only $150 billion out of the trillion dollars went to the people. What happened to the $85 trillion? And then he continues. Talks about never do for the poor what they're capable of doing for themselves. This is a guy <laughs> that's been doing charity for 40 years, and he says, I'm here to tell you more churches and charities are destroying communities coming from a good place, but they're hurting them. So I'm listening to this recording. It has nothing to do with politics. All he's doing is calling out churches, and he's calling out charities. And I said, I'm like, well, what is this guy's point? You know, look, look at the subtitle right there, Tom. How the church hurts those they help and how to reverse it. This is a guy that's a Christian guy that's been raising money for 40 years, and he's saying this. The more you read the book, the premise is you think you're helping people by giving them money. You're actually not. You're hurting these people. So when these guys were talking about let's send money to people, Let's do another trillion dollars. Let's do another trillion dollars. Let's do two. Let's take care of these people. Let's do what's Andrew Yang's plan about a thousand dollars every month being given to people. What did he call that? Uh, UBI, Universal Basic, Basic income. income. Let's send people money. This is we can afford it. We can afford it. We can afford it. Well, guess well they what? need a living wage. Wait, who determines what the living exactly. wage is? And the government starts turning the dial on what a living... You know what? A living wage should be a Ford pickup. So I'm going to turn the dial up. Oh, is it election year? We're giving everybody a truck now? They send them the money, and then all of a sudden, you know what they did with all this money they sent to help the poor? You know what they really helped? The rich. Because what they yep. don't realize, poor people's problems is their habits. Listen, when I was broke, and if it was $50 in my bank account, all I knew what to do with the $50 was what? To spend it. If I had $500, guys, let's go out. It's on me. If I had $400, I had such a poor, broke mentality with money. Until that changed, nothing was going to change. So rather than trying to help these folks with the money you send to them that they don't know what to do with it, first thing we got to do is teach them about how money works. But nobody wants to teach people how money works. It's all the other stuff that people want to talk about. This book, Psycho-Cybernetics, this guy, Tom, who becomes a, a um, surgeon. He does cosmetic surgery for 15, 20 years. They ask him, they said, why did you become a cosmetic surgeon? He says, because I wanted to make people happy. And he says, every time I would do surgery, this, this book sold, by the way, 35, 40 million copies. He said, every time we would do surgery, I would look at their faces. They were so happy. And I'm like, man, I made somebody happy today. Breast augmentation or face or whatever he was doing. He says, you know what happened six months later? They went back to the same depressed, miserable people they were. Mm -hmm. He says, I realized after doing this for 15, 20 years, you can't make people happy from the inside, from the outside. You can only make them happy from the inside. So he went and got away from that business and started becoming a psychologist, working with people on the mindset, writes a book called Psycho Cybernetics, sells 35 million copies. What we're trying to solve all these poor people's problems from the outside by sending money to them. Why don't we work from the brain? Why don't we work from teaching them mentally on how to deal with their finances and other areas of their lives? So the next time it comes to vote for sending more free money to people, just remember this. The more free money you send to the market, all you're doing is making the rich richer, and the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poor because your policies that sound noble on the outside actually destroys middle America. Tom? I, I completely agree. And Pat, you know where my charitable heart is, but you also know that my charitable heart changed about 12 years ago because I was, I was part of American mega churches and you know i was a person attending there but then i would look around and say now wait a minute you know where can the church have the highest impact during a disaster karina there's not people down there it you know it didn't rain four foot of water and then you know uh lake Pontchartrain flood because of their habits it was because of hurricane katrina and you can go down and provide relief and you can meet certain basic needs. You and I both know of a church in, um, in Dallas where we used to go. And uh, they operated a medical clinic for people who did not have medical insurance. But they didn't come in there to get a gift. They came in there to get 
you know, an antibiotic when they had bronchitis and they had no, you know, um, medical insurance or it was a single mom that had inadequate insurance. That is where charities can stand in the gap where 90 percent of that dollar is providing a bridge on something that is not lifestyle related. And what you're talking about, there are there are organizations out there and they hate them. You remember what the auto industry thought of J.D. Power the first time they were putting out those awards? They were like, who is this SOB that's doing this? And they hated it because the lists were real and they couldn't just put million dollar marketing around the list. Sorry, dude, your SUV is not reliable and therefore you don't get the JD Power Quality Award. Now people, you know, that kind of forced them. What's happening in charities, Pat, is there are organizations out there that are looking at the two taxes. Tax number one, you give a dollar to a charity, how much of that dollar gets used up by the local administration, the people in America collecting the dollar, operating the office. Mm -hmm. And if it's more than about eight to 12 percent, that's an inefficient charity. The second is how much of the dollar. So now let's just say 10 percent. Now we have 90 cents. Oh, we're 90 cents. We're going to feed the children in Africa. Okay, how much gets to them and what was it doing? And then you find out that there is a government tax in there, that the government actually snatched 50% of that. Or that you do the most terrible thing is you buy commodity like flour and things like this. That's a tradable commodity. Guess who takes it? Hmm. Half of it gets taken by the, by the government. And the government then sells it. So the average American doesn't know. I gave a dollar. Wait a minute. A dime went to these guys' administration in the U.S., and then the rest went, me, <clears throat> got to Africa. And that's exactly what he's talking about. This guy, let me, let me tell you what he says. He's so right about toxic charity. Here's what he talks about in the book. He says, uh, he says uh, uh, Lupton's Oath offers six basic guidelines. Never do for the poor what they can do for themselves. Amen. Two, limit one-way giving to emergencies. Yes. Three, Empower the poor through employment, lending, and investing using grants sparingly to reinforce, reinforce achievements. Four, subordinate self-interest to the needs of those being served. Five, listen closely to those you seek to help, and in particular, listen to what is not said. Be apparently felt, and above them all, do no harm. And then he talks about the five cycle, okay? This, this is very powerful. The ever-descending life cycle of charity, one-way charity. Give once, and you elicit, uh, uh, give once and you elicit appreciation. Give twice and you create anticipation. You're going to give it to me again. I anticipate. Give three times and you create expectation. Where's my money? Give four times and it becomes entitlement. <laughs> give five times and you establish dependency. Okay? Very interesting when you think about this. Give once, you elicit appreciation. Give twice, you create anticipation. Give three times, you create expectation. Give four times, it becomes entitlement. And give five times, you establish dependence. Well, you know what this means? And I'm, gonna make a, I'm not going to make enemies here, but I'm going to uh, upset some people. So those of you that are Christian churches preaching from the pulpit about how, what is welfare done, look how welfare has messed up our city. They've created the dependency of these people. Look in the mirror because some of the stuff you're doing is causing the same thing. Yeah, and it's happening. I mean, you 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 know. And by the way, <clears throat> I learned this the hard way. In my third year in business, I was 24, 25 years old, 26 years old. I opened up my own sales office, and I had a good friend of mine who was one of my sales guys. And he starts making money, but he starts dating this girl, and he buys her like a three, four, five thousand dollar ring. Then he takes her on this, you know, place, and he's spending all this money. And he says, I can't afford to pay rent this month. And he says, But you make money off me, so give me a break for one month. I said, No problem. Give me a break for a second month, no problem. Give me a break for a third month, no problem. You know what happened by the fourth month? By the fourth month, it was expected that he doesn't need to pay rent. By the eighth month, when I asked for rent of the previous eight months that I was paying myself, he became an enemy. Relationship changed from that day on. So as much as you're thinking you're doing good, you're hurting them when you go out of your way. So if you like this clip and you want to watch another one, click right here. And if you want to watch the entire podcast, click right here.